everything CrossFit. I'm Ruth Grace Quasi, daughter at Everything CrossFit. Um. And this is a little story about Ruth Grace's journey so far. For those of you joining our channel and don't know anything about Ruth Grace, Ruth Grace is my eldest daughter. She is 10, nearly 11. Yes. And, and back in October 2016, Ruth Grace was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, which is a form of bone cancer. So leading up to that diagnosis, we'd had a couple of moments um, of pain. Nothing huge. No. Ruth Grace was um, learning to do karate and in the July had said that her leg was hurting a little bit um, after she'd been to karate and a couple of times before she'd gone to karate she said it was hurting. To be honest, Ruth Grace had started to get a bit lazy in the summer holidays and I didn't think it was anything related to the karate. I thought it was related to the fact that Ruth Grace was being lazy. Yeah. Because you were, weren't you? Pretty much. Um, and I thought she was using it as a little bit of an excuse to get out of having to go to karate lessons. Uh, that being said, in the August, we went on holiday to, to Malaga. And whilst there, Ruth Grace was moaning again about a lot of life pain. Not every day, just every now and then. But when we're on holiday, we do walk. Uh, well, my husband walks the children's quite a lot. Um, likes to take them out on long walks and to keep them entertained. She did bang her leg in the swimming pool. So again, we put me down to maybe the fact that she'd walked so much, maybe that she'd banged her leg. But it wasn't anything that was needing any medication or any pain relief. It was just the odd little whine, wasn't it? Yeah. And then nothing was said again until we got back to um, school in September. And in the first couple of weeks of school, probably two or three nights a week, Ruth was moaning that her leg was hurting. But she had just had a massive growth spurt. She'd grown two centimetres. Yay. and she had just come back to school after a very lazy summer holiday so to, for the first week or so we put it down to growing pains and being more active with a little dose of paracetamol she was fine yep. and moaned for the rest of the evening so it was just before bed you'd moan wasn't it yeah. um, and then would be fine for the rest of the evening and this was on and off a couple of nights a week for three weeks or so uh, the first sorry, the first two weeks of school wasn't it yeah I think yeah. so and then on the third week, um, at the end of that third week, she, on the Friday, walked into the corner of my bed. Now, I have a big cast iron bed. It's a horrible bed to walk into when I've walked into it. It bloody hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so Ruth walked into the bed, had a lot of tears and um, upset, and came to us with a bit of a lump on her leg. Well, that would be expected after walking into the corner of my cast iron bed, so we assumed it was just because of that. We gave some pain relief, some ibuprofen, paracetamol, and you got the pain under control, didn't you? Yeah. And then we expected for some tracking to happen, so some bruising to happen over the next couple of days. Nothing happened, but she was still in pain. So on the Monday, after a bit of only an hour, and we took her down to see the general practitioner, the GP, um, and he had a look at the leg, had took a bit of history, and then asked you to leave the room, didn't he? Yeah. Um, she said to Ruth that you need to speak to mummy about something about mummy's house. So you didn't think anything about it, did you? You just popped off to the, the waiting room. Yep. As soon as he asked Ruth Grace to leave the room, I knew in that moment that it wasn't great news. Um, and he was very supportive, but he said that we needed to prepare ourselves that this may not be something um, as easy as a bruise, but that he suspected it was going to be a tumour. When you hear those words from the doctors, you don't believe them. You think... He's going on worst case scenario. He is an amazing doctor and he's always been an amazing doctor. So we did sort of listen a little bit, but our hearts were saying it's going to be different. It's not going to be that. It's going to be fine. The next morning, we uh, tootled down to our local accident and emergency department with a letter from the GP to get your x-ray. Yeah. Um, had the x-ray on the Tuesday morning and then around about half past three on the Tuesday afternoon, the GP rang us to let us know that the x-ray had shown something up. Um, so he phoned us to let us know that it had shown up something and it had shown up an area that did look suspicious, as if it could be an osteosarcoma. Um, I and my husband went into panic mode, but we didn't mention anything to Ruth Grace. We just let her know that there was something on her x-ray that needed a bit more investigation. And we were told that we'd get an appointment through for an MRI within the next few days. However, 
on the Wednesday, your leg was attracted to my bed again, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so on the Wednesday evening, again, Ruth Grace decided to walk into the corner of my cast iron bed. By this point, Ruth Grace had already had most of her pain relief today because her leg was causing a significant pain still. So she'd had all the ibuprofen and paracetamol I could give because it was she was on her way to bed. Yeah. So she'd had her third and fourth dose of uh, those medicines for the day, ready for bedtime. And so when you banged it in the exact same spot on your exact same lump, it really hurt, didn't it? Yes. And we had a bit of a screaming episode and it didn't settle. So at around about half past nine at night, we tootled off to the accident and emergency department at the local children's hospital. Um, went in to see them, explained the situation that she'd got this x-ray that showed a suspicious area in her leg, that we're waiting for an MRI, that she'd banged it again and it was in extreme pain and they decided that you needed some morphine. Yeah. So they admitted her to the CCDU, which is Children's Clinical Decision Unit, <laughs> um, and we then spent the next few days on that unit. So on the Wednesday, they popped Truth Grace down for an MRI, which um, the consultants on the ward at CCDU, because Ruth was so well, and because she hadn't lost any weight, in fact, she'd continued to gain her weight, We we are an eating family, you are putting a bit of weight at the moment, but that's because you're not moving around, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so she hadn't lost any weight, um, was eating fine, hadn't had any sickness, hadn't had any headaches, hadn't um, been in pain for a long period of time. They were convinced it was just going to be something and nothing, possibly a little bit of a bone infection, but um, they were pretty much convinced it wasn't going to be osteosarcoma. They were convinced that it was the MRI was going to rule that out. So then on the Thursday, we did get the results. The consultant was quite gobbledygooked um, and quite apologetic that he got it wrong. Not that we needed his apologies, you know. <laughs> he hadn't given us any guarantees either way. We weren't cross, we weren't upset. But I think he was, he was very concerned that um, he'd got it wrong. But we weren't really. We thought that it was absolutely fine. It's one of those things. And mm. um, the confirmation that it showed something that they did a biopsy was not great and it was at this point that we explained to Ruth Grace that she had a Gertie. Yeah. And Gertie's the name that Ruth gave gave her growth. So it was Gertie the growth. And um, we said that Gertie could be a good growth or a bad growth. And um, we didn't explain to her that uh, what osteosarcoma was because she was only eight at the time. We just explained that Gertie might need a little bit of an operation to take her away or she might need some medicines. But we're hoping it'd just be a little bit of an operation and it'd be fine. So we went home for the weekend and then the following Tuesday popped down to the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Birmingham where you had your biopsy. Yep. And then we had the treacherous one week wait for the results. It was quite late the following day, uh, the following week when the MDT results came through. So, so the results came in quite later on in the working day, so about half past five the results came in but we hadn't expected the phone call because we were told it quite early on if there was anything to worry about. And when the call came up, I asked my to say that yes, the biopsy was uh, confirmed it was osteosarcoma. We had lots of tears in the household. Not you, but mummy and daddy had lots of tears. Grandparents had lots of tears, etc. So that result came in on the Tuesday following the biopsy the Wednesday before. And then the next day we got phone calls from Royal Manchester Hospital inviting us in to come and meet the consultant and the Macmillan nurse and we went in the following day on the Thursday and met um, our consultant at Royal Manchester, um, Dr Bernadette Brennan who is amazing and our Macmillan nurse Andrea Stevenson who is also amazing. And we hadn't really prepped Ruth Grace very well, we just told her we were going to meet some, some medical people. We hadn't used the word cancer because it's a big scary word as far as we were concerned. Um, but when we sat down, Dr. Brennan just said quite clearly to Ruth, so you've got cancer and this is what we're going to do. And Ruth just took it in a stride, absolutely every step in the, uh, of the journey she's taken in a stride really. She's been so brave. Um, but it was a whirlwind, so from us originally going into hospital, um, at the middle of September to the biopsy on the 28th of, dis of September to the results on the 4th of October to starting chemo the week after. It was all very, very, very quick. 
Um, and we didn't really get a chance to stop and think about it. We just got wished along on the journey, didn't we? Yeah. So bone cancer osteosarcoma is the most common type of bone cancer. But bone cancer in general is not a common cancer to have, especially um, in comparison to things like leukemia, neuroblastomas, um, brain tumours, etc. Osteosarcoma is one of the least um, diagnosed cancers for children. It is only found in either children or elderly people generally. So the 90% of the diagnosis will happen in childhood and the rest will happen in adulthood. Because of this, clinical trials don't happen very often. It's not like breast cancer where um, the, there's been so many medical, tri medical trials and advances in medicine that now your chances of survival are so much better because um, it's a common cancer and people have wanted to eradicate it. Bone cancer only affects around about 30 children per year in the UK and therefore doesn't receive any funding. There hasn't been any advances in medical, um, medical treatment for osteosarcoma in 30 years in 60 years, sorry, and the rates of um, survival haven't changed in the last 30 years. So the rates of survival are really poor in osteosarcoma, so we count ourselves very lucky that we're here today um, and that we managed to catch it quite quick and that Ruth Grace responded well to the chemotherapy. The Ruth chemotherapy consisted of three drugs. It was called MAC chemotherapy and it consisted of methotrexate, doxorubicin and cisplatin. Cisplatin is known to affect your hearts and your kidneys, as is doxorubicin. Doxorubicin also crosses the, um, the brain stem barrier, so it does actually affect your brain as well. And methotrexate is just vile and affects everywhere in your body. Unfortunately, Ruth Grace doesn't like to be simple and decided to have quite a few reactions along the way. So her first reaction happened after the first dose of methotrexate. Yeah. Um, so the, the program of chemotherapy is you have a dose of methotrexate over three days. Yeah. And then you have a weekend off and then you go back in the following week and another three to four days of methotrexate. Then you have a full two weeks off and then you have a um, is platin and doxorubicin on week five so it's a five week schedule um so the first dose of methotrexate was given mm -hmm. and with grace was doing okay started very quickly with thickness and was quite sick quite quickly or was it the other way around is it doxorubicin yeah, sorry because i remember having methotrexate last so the chemotherapy regime is map which um, includes methotrexate, doxorubicin and cisplatin. It is a five week program of treatment. So on week one you have your cisplatin and doxorubicin. You then have two weeks of chemotherapy and then you have um, a week of methotrexate and a weekend off, a week of methotrexate and the weekend off and then go back to the start of the cycle. So uh, the first week of cisplatin and doxorubicin went okay. However, Ruth Grace did hit sickness very quickly. You were a very sick child to um, chemotherapy, weren't you? Yes. So uh, it took several drugs. Ruth ended up on about three or four, was it four? Four yeah. sickness, anti-sickness drugs to maintain her from being sick when she was on the treatment. And it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> it was better. It was better. It was better, but she was still quite vomited throughout the treatments, but the four chemotherapy drugs did keep it to a, a bare minimum. Well, we got it settled, didn't we? Yeah. Um, we went home after the first week. We managed the weekend at home, and then we were back in with a temperature, which is one of the things, the side effects of the chemotherapy we has, is you basically don't get your two weeks at home. You will be in and out with temperatures. You will be in and out with complications of chemotherapy, whether it be mucositis, whether it be kidney infections, whether it be urine infections, whether it be temperatures, as I said. Um, so we managed to get the weekend at home, we were remitted on the Monday, spent the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in, got home on the yeah. Thursday, came back in on the Friday, uh, we're in the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, went home on the Monday, oh, we're in and out. Um, and then we were still in, yeah. after being sick at the weekend, uh, when they started the methotrexate. So we first started the methotrexate on the Monday and on the Thursday started to develop some blisters 
nothing major, just a few um, on a chest, around a wiggle out. A wiggle is um, a central line, um, a Hickman line, which goes straight into a body. So we, around up, here. Yeah, so we ended up with some blisters around this area, some blisters on our skin, some blisters on our feet. Nothing major, we went in and um, they thought it was just one of, one of those things, that they didn't think it was anything yeah. major. Um, kept you in over the weekend, um, put you on some medicines to keep you comfortable, um, but decided to go ahead as normal the next Monday with your methotrexate. What we now know is that was the start of a toxicity to her methotrexate and the start of Stephen Johnson's syndrome because Ruth was having an allergic reaction. So she'd already had a minor allergic reaction to the first dose um, and when the second dose was given we had a massive reaction, didn't we? Yeah. So very quickly those small blisters turned into quite big blisters and quite deep tissue blisters um, and by the end of Wednesday she was covered from head to toe internally and externally with blisters. Her feet were one big blister, she had blisters that covered the whole of her ears. She oh, was yeah. really quite uncomfortable and really quite poorly. And they weren't really sure what it was to start with. Um, so to start with, because the blisters were quite small, uh, but all over, they thought maybe it was chicken pox. So they treated her for chicken pox, they took swabs, um, they isolated her so that she didn't pass it to anyone else who had chemotherapy, uh, was having chemotherapy and immune suppressed. But all those swabs came back negative, it wasn't um, chicken pox, and as the blisters got worse and worse and worse, and as Ruth got polio and polio, um, she ended up on oxygen, she ended up on lots of medicines, and it wasn't until um, a week post reaction that we eventually got the final diagnosis that it was Stephen Johnson's. Once we got that, we were able to treat it. Uh, and you recovered quite quickly, really. So it was the Monday they confirmed it was the Stephen Johnson's, mm -hmm. and then we started on the treatment. Uh, started on the treatment on the Monday, and by the Friday you were feeling much better, weren't you? Yeah. However, Ruth Grace has is now a bit of a historical uh, figure on Ward eighty four. So if children <laughs> come in and have a little bit of a reaction, they'll go, "Oh, that's nothing. You should have seen Ruth Grace." <laughs> um, and she was photographed by medical photographers because they wanted to make sure they had it documented. So you became a bit of a famous for it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> the only problem was having a Stephen Johnson's reaction that bad meant that Ruth Grace could no longer have methotrexate. So by taking the methotrexate out of the regime for chemotherapy, it shortened her chemotherapy route. It was worrying because obviously if you take away one drug that you're giving twice in every five week cycle, um, we did worry that it would reduce your chances um, of fighting the disease, but yeah. you did well without it, didn't you? Yeah. But because she also didn't have the methotrex, it also meant she couldn't have immunotherapy, so she couldn't have um, the immune therapy which would prevent her getting a recurrence. Luckily, touch wood. I'm not wood. Um, <laughs> we haven't had any recurrences as yet, but you know we would have preferred to have had the full chemotherapy regime and to have had the immunotherapy. So we carried on then with this is Platinum and Dr. Rubesin, which still made Ruth really poorly. And we went on to a three week cycle. So we had chemotherapy week one, uh, week two and three in and out of hospital with temperatures and illnesses. And then um, at the end of that cycle, we then waited for your surgery. Because Ruth had finished her chemotherapy slightly earlier than expected, because we weren't having the methotrexate, eh? um, we had to wait a few weeks before you could have your surgery. Then we popped down just before Christmas yep. to Birmingham and we had we literally the week before Christmas and went in for her surgery. So Ruth Grace has had something called limb salvage surgery, which is um, where they take away the bone infected by the key, uh, by the cancer and replace it with another option. So with Ruth Grace she's had a cadaver bone implanted you could have she could have possibly had a metal implant but um it wasn't viable for Ruth to have a metal implant because of how close to her knee the bone cancer stretched so she's had a cadaver bone so we thank the family who very kindly donated that bone over in miami through the miami tissue bank over there um for a cadaver bone to be used it's got to have come from somebody who has died in non-medical circumstances really so they can't have had any illness etc 
So unfortunately it tends to mean that they've been injured either by a road traffic accident or by a fall or by being shot or stabbed, things like that. So we know that that family will have lost their loved one in very traumatic situations um, and for them in that situation to have made the option to make the decision to donate the bone, it, we're very grateful for because without that, Ruth Grace wouldn't have been able to keep her leg this long. So the donor bone was used to replace her tibia, and Ruth Grace's fibula was removed and put inside the donor tibia because the donor tibia is essentially a dead bone when it arrives. Uh, so they put the fibula inside it to promote it to have a bone marrow and to help, help her body accept it. It's then held in with some metal scaffolding and screws and fixators, and then she was popped in a cast. So Ruth Grace was non-weight bearing for four months post-surgery while we waited for the bone to be accepted. So we started the physiotherapy room. And she had some hydrotherapy and started to get some movement back. Obviously she'd had a legging cast like this for a long period of time. She hadn't learned to bend a knee. She had to relearn all that, bending a knee and learning walking again. Ruth Grace never really got walking fully, but that's another story we'll come to in a moment. And then, just as we came to the end of her chemotherapy route, Ruth Grace decided that again, she wanted to be really difficult and really different. And she wanted to have um, an issue with the cisplatin drug effect in her body. And this ended up with Ruth Grace spending um, a considerable time in HDU because her kid has decided to leak out everything. So we leaked out our phosphate, our magnesium, our calcium, calcium, our sodium. We leaked out everything. Well, we say we, we mean you. We leaked out everything, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so Ruth Grace ended up being very cramped in because there was no calcium. So her ball, whole body started to cramp up everything in her hands. For example, her hands were cramped in like this and Ruth would try to open them up and she could get to about there and then her body was shut down and cramping, her legs were cramped in, her toes were cramped in, her, her whole body was cramped in because of the lack of calcium. So middle way through the uh, one evening, we've been in hospital for a while, they've been trying to dose you up, we've been in about a week had we? Probably. They've been trying to keep her levels dosed up and then they did some bloods one evening around about 11 o'clock as per usual and you dropped again. So nothing they were putting in was staying in and we needed to go in for some special infusions down in HDU. And I have to say for me, that was another scary moment because it was one of those nights where Daddy was at home with our other daughter. Uh, so Daddy Crosby, Stuart Crosby was at home with our other daughter, Amelia Crosby. And my daughter, this one, and I were in hospital and she was down to HDU and it was scary. Luckily, Daddy managed to wake, um, well, Daddy, not luckily, Amelia woke very early the next morning, so Daddy was very lucky to be able to go and drop her off at grandparents and come and join us at HDU quite early on. And then we spent the next few days at HDU as um, a family of three with Amelia being cared for by family. It was the Easter weekend, which wasn't great. Yeah. Um, so we ended up in the Mac House, uh, the Ronald McDonald Mac House, which is a family accommodation, so that Amelia could come and join us while we were caring for you. Yeah. Uh, eventually got you dosed up and back onto a normal ward um, but it took a long time to recover didn't it yeah uh, once we finished chemotherapy uh, we just went through the normal process of monitoring so she's had x-rays of her chest every six weeks to start with then we went to every eight weeks and then very recently we've just moved to every every 12 weeks Around about September last year, we realised that Ruth Grace's leg wasn't healing as the way it should do. So she's been trying to get up and moving since the surgery in December 2016. So following the surgery in December 2016, Ruth Grace has never really got up and walking fully. She's got up and walking a little bit, but she's always needed an aid. Um, for a long time, she's been in, in and out of casts. Um, the times when we haven't been in cash, she's always needed a crutches or a wheelchair. And everyone kept saying, we just need to keep going, we just need to keep going, just keep giving it more time. Um, and trying to we're pushing Ruth as hard as we could to do a physiotherapy at home, a physiotherapy at the hospital, and to keep on pushing through any pain to get walking. In September last year, so September um, 18, we eventually got the news that it wasn't healing. There was nothing else really that they could say apart from it wasn't healing, and that we'd need to go under 
um, some investigations to try and find out why. So the plan was to remove the metalwork within with Grace's leg and to put her into an external fixator, which is the big Meccano sets on the, the big circular Meccano sets which have um, ropes going into the bone to, to keep the bone stable. Um, so that was the plan. We were going to do that to try and get your leg to heal. Yeah. In February this year, I think February 19, she had the surgery to remove the metal work. And whilst in there, they discovered that actually the bones were in a worse position than we expected. Mm. So Ruth Grace has now been in this cast again since February, so you're getting very fed up now, aren't you? Yes. Um, but what the decision was a couple of weeks ago was that they were going to have to amputate. There was nothing else they could do to save this leg. Um, so we had to amputate. This Friday, just gone, we met with the, um, the prosthetic team and they have confirmed that, yep, we're going to go ahead with, pro um, with a prosthetic limb and amputation and you're going to have something called knee disarticulation, which is basically a through knee amputation. Um, this is going to be better for Ruth in the long term because it means that she'll continue to have both growth plates in the leg and will end up being quite even with her knee position um, with the prosthetic as she gets older. So that's where we're up to. We are going to take you along on the journey with us as she goes through neck surgeries and through learning how to re-walk with a prosthetic. But you're quite happy, aren't you? Yeah. So it's been a bit more difficult for us to get our heads around everything on the journey, but Ruth Grace is a positive, positive young lady um, who just wants to get on with her life and enjoy it, don't you? Yeah. So thank you very much for listening to our long story. Thank you for um, continuing to watch our channel. We've been, been everything, everything Crosby. Crosby. You've, You've been, been our amazing, amazing viewers. And bye-bye.